Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today I wanted to talk about something a little bit different than what I usually talk about on this channel. The Overwatch League is something of course I talk about on a regular basis. I talk about it in my you know weekly videos where I give my thoughts on the picks or thoughts on the matches and I give my picks uh, for each week. But today I want to talk about something very different, something I don't normally talk about, and that is a specific team and a specific topic surrounding that team. And for, for that, I wanted to focus on the New York Excelsior, and I wanted to focus on their playoff curse. This is a playoff curse that has been plaguing them since before the Overwatch League. It is something that they have just been kind of really just suffering with for a long time. They can win in the, the, the somewhat big stage, but when it comes to the big tournaments, they always fall short. And we have seen it now... In Apex, we have seen it now in the Overwatch League's first season, we've seen it in the Overwatch League's second season with what we've seen so far, and it's something very, very big for this team. So, to start, we need to do a brief history of the New York Excelsior before the Overwatch League and before they became the New York Excelsior. Um, I'm not the best source of pre-Overwatch League history. Sideshow did a very great video back in January of 2018 where he talked about the legend of LW Blue and LW Red. I will link that video in the description if you want to check that out. It's about 43 minutes, but it's a very good video. You get a an understanding of this team and their history and kind of how they came to be what they are now. And it's a good video. It's a good video if you want to just learn more about the team that has become the New York Excelsior and you want to learn more about you know where they were in the past. But to, to put it simply, LW Blue, which is the majority of the New York Excelsior roster, when it was originally formed, it was seen as this secondary team to LW Red. Um, the old LW Blue was really just underperforming and not doing very well. So right before Apex Season 1, LW, or Luxury Watch, retools the roster. They kind of uh, get rid of most of the roster, and they keep a couple of players. Uh, Gambler, of course, a player who was on the Soul Dynasty in Season 1, and Luna. Uh, the rest of the team, they essentially get rid of. Uh, so they bring in Sabioli, they bring in Mecco, they bring in Jonas, and they bring in No Name. So this is their team that they kind of focus this new retooled roster on going into Apex Season 1. Their hope is that they will get both of their teams, LW Blue and LW Red, into Apex Season 1. Now, LW Red is a team that is focused around Pine and Flower, mostly, and they're like the two best DPS players at the time. They're really just kind of destroying teams. Well, LDB Red fails to qualify because they lose to Runaway twice uh, in the qualifications, while LW Blue, seen as the secondary roster, qualifies. And even though LW Blue qualified and LW Red didn't, the organization still saw Red as the top team. So LW Blue gets into Apex Season 1, they do fine, you know, they get, I believe, you know, out of the group stage, but, you know, they weren't expected to make it very far. LW Red is in the scene right below them. They're destroying teams. Pine and Flower are just kind of destroying everybody. And the idea is still that LW Red is the better team. Moving towards Apex Season 2, the Luxury Watch gets an invite to this tournament. It's not a major tournament. It's, you know, some kind of, like, you know, minor tournament. And they are deciding, you know, we're, we want to compete in this, but they have to decide which team to field. And they decide to do a combination of the LW Blue and LW Red um, rosters. And the only real difference is it's LW Blue, but instead of no name, it's Flower. Uh, and they call it LW Red, but that's not really important. So this team starts to gain some synergy because they're a better team teamwork-wise. They completely destroy this tournament, but Flower then moves back to LW Red, and uh, qualifications are coming for Apex Season 2, and LW Red once again fails to qualify, but LW Blue makes it. So they now switch Flower full-time over to LW Blue. They decide, we're going to focus fully on this roster now, LW Red, no longer the roster we care about. LW Blues are a better roster. We're going to focus on them. They're kind of the favorites going into Apex Season 2. They don't win, though. They fall short. Teamwork kind of falls apart. Coaching decisions kind of fall apart. 
kind of a questionable end to Apex Season 2 for them, though they still performed very well. They had to play some very tough teams to get there. They make it into Apex Season 3. They do okay. Uh, they make it into the second round. They lose to Kongdu Panthera, and they lose to Lunge to Kai, two of the top teams. And they were, of course, knocked out of Apex Season 2 by none other than Runaway. So there's a long history between LW Blue and Runaway, which is, of course, New York Excelsior and Vancouver Titans. Apex Season 4, LW Blue dropped out beforehand. Um, the reason why is not fully known, um, but in general is because they were going into the Overwatch League and they were going to be doing some stuff to kind of prepare them for that. Moving into the Overwatch League, of course, they have Pine now on their roster, who had been playing flex support for a little while um, because of some injuries uh, to Jonas and whatnot. So right before they move into this, uh, they bring over, uh, they bring in Mono as a new player uh, to back up Jonas, and then obviously we know now how that turned out. And they bring in Jonak, this unknown player, you know, in the pro scene who just kind of was destroying people in the ladder. So they sign him to the team. He doesn't do anything before he joins New York Excelsior. He's never played in any big tournament for New York Excelsior. But they bring him in, and then they sign the majority of this roster. So you have Sabiobi, Mecco, Jonas, Pine, Mono, Jonak, and Flower. If you've noticed, they don't have a main support at this time. So they go to LW Red, where they have Ark. Also, though, Flower's too young to actually play, and that means they have Sabiobi and Pine, who are both hitscan DPS players, which means they don't have a projectile DPS player, so they find one in Libero, uh, who is with Meta Athena at the time. So that's their roster going into the season. It's largely LW Blue, but they kind of add in some new players there, and they have Wizard Young, and they have um, Pavane as their coaching staff. So that's the team. And they perform very well in the first two stages of the Overwatch League. We see how good Jonak is, we see Mono performing very well, kind of outperforming Jonas, um, which was a bit of a surprise because people expected Jonas to be the player that they ran with, though Mono was the main tank for Team Korea, for Team South Korea in the 2017 World Cup, so there's a little bit of kind of understanding that New York Excelsior was a very good team. They failed to win the Stage 1 uh, playoffs in Season 1, but they win Stage 2 playoffs, they had Animo, another support player, coming from Ardeon, another good team. And then they win Stage 3 playoffs. They're, you know, completely dominating all the teams in Overwatch League Season 1. They don't win season, Stage 4 playoffs, but the idea is we don't really care about that. We care about the season playoffs. And then they fall short in the season playoffs. Losing to Philadelphia Fusion. So they do all this stuff, and then all of a sudden you're like, huh. Well, that, that's not right. That isn't what we planned to do. But they were such a good team in Season 1 that no one really expected them to fall off in Season 2. They were still one of the favorites, but new teams were coming in. And one of those teams, of course, is the Vancouver Titans, who are runaway, who were the bane of LW Blue's existence uh, back in the old days of Overwatch. So now... The question comes to, well, what is happening now that this team is struggling? Why are they finding so much difficulty in Season 2 that they were not finding back in Season 1? And in general, there's multiple reasons for that. One, you have to put that to, there's a lot of better teams now. San Francisco Shock are a very good team. Vancouver Titans are a very good team. We, we've seen the gap between the top and the bottom shrink massively. New York was the definitive best team in the league last season. There was no challenge until they got to season playoffs and they fell short. Meta didn't really favor them, so that's part of it. But also, and I'd say this is a much bigger part of it, was that they choked. They, they fell short on the big stage massively. And it's something that we had seen them do back in the days of Apex as LW Blue. Now we move into season two and they're losing stage playoffs. Obviously, they lose in the quarterfinals of Seoul Dynasty. They lose in the semifinals of the Stage 2 playoffs to the Vancouver Titans. A very good series from them, a very good match for them. If they didn't have to play Vancouver Titans, they had to play San Francisco Shock instead, which wouldn't have gone very well either. You know, maybe they make the, the Stage Finals, but the road for the playoffs was to play arguably the best team in the league at the time, or the second best team in the league at the time, and you're looking at the third best team in the league in the New York Excelsior. So, yeah, 
they fall to a team that is better than they are. That's not that bad. Stage two of this season was pretty good for New York, I think in terms of their playoff performance. Yeah, they'd lost the two matches to Atlanta Reign during the stage, but you have a good series against the Vancouver Titans. Even if it's a 4-1 series, it's a very close series. They played against them very well. They did a lot to kind of counter them. Mono outplayed Bumper a lot in that series. So you kind of have hope for New York. They looked very good in this in Stage 2. They do a very good thing there. They look like a team that really can compete with these teams, you know, San Francisco and Vancouver, going into Stage 3. It's going to be a very good stage for them. They go undefeated in Stage 3, and then you get to the Stage 3 playoffs, and they lose to Shanghai Dragons. They get completely obliterated. And Stage 3 playoffs are one of the worst performances from New York I've ever seen, and one of the most confusing performances I've ever seen. And it's where this problem kind of manifests itself. Now, when New York lost to Shanghai, nobody knew that Shanghai was going to win the Stage 3 championship at the time. No one knew they were going to do it. Everyone's like, okay, yeah, they beat New York, but now they're going to play Vancouver. And Vancouver looks very good. They're not going to beat them. Well, then they beat Vancouver. And people are like, okay, wait. Shanghai's looking kind of good right now. But can they beat Valiant or Shock? And then the Shock win. They're like, okay, can they beat the Shock? And then they beat the Shock. Very close 4-3 series. And people are like, okay, so the Dragons are actually really good. So maybe them beating New York isn't weird. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. New York lost to a team that also beat Vancouver and San Francisco, who you would argue, are better teams right now than New York is anyway, so maybe Shanghai is just really good and they have finally kind of clicked and they've really kind of got things rolling and we don't have to worry about New York. They didn't choke, it's just that they lost to a team better than them. And I definitely think you can kind of lessen the blow of New York's loss in the stage playoffs to that, that Shanghai is a very good team and we saw how well they performed against Vancouver and how well they performed against San Francisco, and you can take some of the blow of the loss away. But you can't take all of it, because ultimately I think you see where the main problem with the New York Excelsior lies, and I believe the match against the Shanghai Dragons is really where you can look and you can say, this is this team's problem. This team, as an organization, coaching, um, ownership right now when you look at it they look at their roster and they say we have what we need we have our own style we know the way we play so we're just going to play our game the way we play it and we're going to be fine new york has always been a team that plays slow they play kind of meticulous they don't go for the throat they play very well they know they have very good players they know they have players that are almost guaranteed to be better than all of the players on your team in every single position. So we have a main support who's better than your main support, and a main tank is better than your main tank, and we work well together as a team, so we're just going to play our game the same way every single week. We're not going to do anything special each week. We're going to go, and we're going to win, and that's how we're going to do things. They did this back in Apex. Uh, Sideshow touches on that in his, in his video. They did that back in Season 1 of the Overwatch League, and they did a lot this season. They don't prepare specifically for teams. They don't put in the work that way. On the surface, it doesn't seem like they do. Now, obviously, I could be wrong. I don't actually know if that's true. Um, they very well could uh, be a team that is putting in their all every single time that the coaching staff is doing anything. The coaching staff very easily could be doing, you know, a thing going like, "Here's what we're doing. We're going to prep this specific strategy for this team, and this is how we're going to do things." Because we've seen them come out and do different things, but it's never seemingly something like we're going to do this specifically for this team it's i want to start moving us towards this direction and this is the game we're going to start doing it in or it's something like this is a weaker team we know we don't have to put in our best players so let's put in flower against the washington justice or let's put in you know this weird composition on this map because this is a team that's not very good we're not really worried about them beating us so we're just going to run through them anyway and it's fine and we've seen how they've struggled this season with that mentality, which is something that we can't know for sure that's a mentality they have, but on the surface, it seems like that is something they're doing. So what's the problem? Ultimately, I think the problem with this team lies in coaching. I don't think this team has a problem with its roster. Sure, they make mistakes. Sure, sometimes their coordination, their teamwork falls apart, but when you look back at season one, this team was very, very good. 
right? There were times of this team, something you see Vancouver do a lot now, but there were times this team, you'd have a 6v4, and everyone's like, New York's going to pull out of this fight. There's no way they're going to win this fight. They know that they can't, and they charge in, and they just completely decimate the other team. They're down two, but they know how to win fights. And this is something that was instilled in them by their coaching staff and the players just knowing their limits. We see that a lot with Vancouver now this season. And I think a lot of it was who they had playing at the time. One of the biggest issues I think they've had this season in stage one and stage two was they were not playing Sabiobi. He is this team's leader. If you can put Sabiobi in and you think your best chance of winning is having Sabiobi in, he should be playing. Even if you think your chance of winning with Sabiobi in is 1% 1% less than any other thing, you should have Sabiobi in. Even if it's 10% less, you should have Sabiobi in because he's this team's leader. So why, when you look at stage three playoffs against Shanghai, when they ran Sabiobi for the entirety of stage three, because they understood, one, he's the leader, two, Sombra's really good and Sabiobi is probably our best bet at Sombra, and three, this guy's our leader. He is the person who leads this team. He is the one who calms the team down, who collects the team together and says, here's what we need to do. Here's how we need to do it. Mono has seemingly been taking that leadership role for most of this season, but you have him playing for almost all of stage three. He misses a, you know, a couple maps here and there. You go into stage three playoffs, the biggest game of the stage, and you just decide we're not going to run Sabiobi at all. Not once. We're going to run some Sombra here and there, but we're going to run Nene on Sombra. What were they thinking? You can't, you can't possibly say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to run Sabio with the entirety of stage three, and then in the biggest game, we're just not going to run him at all. That's a coaching decision right then and there. The, unless Sabio B, you know, physically couldn't play, there's no reason why he shouldn't have been playing. You know, if he was injured or he had a family issue to deal with, something like that, I understand that, and if that's why he didn't play, then I get that. If that isn't the case... There's no reason why he should have been on the bench. Sabiobi wouldn't have wanted to be on the bench. He, you know, we saw something where he said, when I wasn't playing, I considered retiring because this is his life. This is his drive. And they just decided, we don't need him to play. The coaching staff makes very questionable decisions. I don't believe this coaching staff really understands pressure very well, and they feel very scared when pressure comes. And they kind of fall back on the things that they know. We know we're good at GOATs. We know we're good at 3-3, so we're going to run 3-3 into the Shanghai Dragons. Well, if you know anything about the Shanghai Dragons, you know that 3-3 doesn't work against them. That's the whole thing that they've been doing the whole season, is building against 3-3 by building these DPS compositions with Sombra as a main part and Farah as a main part and Widowmaker as a main part now. But for whatever reason, that's what they decided to do. And one of the things you wonder, at least I do, how big was Wizard Young to New York Excelsior success? Because he's obviously a very, very, very prideful person. I don't mean that in a negative way. He's very, very, very high on himself. He's very proud of what he does. And I think that's respectable. He thinks he's the best coach in the league. And that's the mentality you need to have. He was, of course, a big part of New York Excelsior success last season. And it makes you wonder sometimes, at least it makes me wonder, as I said, was he actually one of the most important parts to NYXL success was he the one who was kind of willing to say pull the trigger we're going to do this thing because Pavane seems very passive he seems to not want to really do certain things and obviously I don't know for sure that Pavane is the one who's making these decisions but he's the head coach ultimately these decisions fall on him Sabio should have never been taken out in the stage three playoffs This team needs to prove they can win matches against these best teams in the league. Yeah, they beat San Francisco Shock in Stage 1. Shock weren't as good as they are now, but it was a good win for New York. It was a very good win for New York when they beat San Francisco Shock back in Stage 1. They haven't beaten the Vancouver Titans. They have to start Stage 4 playing against the LA Gladiators. They have to play the Vancouver Titans in Stage 4. They have to play the Hangzhou Spark in Stage 4. They have to play the Guangzhou Charge and the Chengdu Hunters. Some very good teams in the Pacific Division. Pacific Division is very good this season. Sideshow brought up a very good point at one point in one of the post shows uh, when they lost to Shanghai. He said maybe New York isn't actually that good. Maybe it's just because they play in the Atlantic Division. They're just running through all these really bad teams. Maybe they're really not that good. And the Pacific Division is just so good 
that, you know, we are seeing all these teams that are doing really well, whereas New York is just the teams in their division. They're just running through everybody. They don't have any worries. Now, their two losses in the regular season are two Atlantic teams who prepared for them. The problem that New York has, as I see it, is you have coaching that is unwilling to focus heavily on specific team ideas each week. Which I understand that you can't, obviously, every single week um, develop this massive plan that's the super in-depth plan for each team that you're going to go up against. It's almost impossible, if not just completely impossible. Where I think you really kind of see the problems, though, is when you get to the big stage with this team, I think they don't take pressure well. If they're in just a normal match where there isn't that kind of high stakes, um, you know, title on the line, they seemingly can clutch things out. They have so many map five wins and reverse sweeps. They've done it a lot when they're not playing in the stage playoffs. They did it in the stage playoffs last season against Philadelphia Fusion. Um, they, of course, played very well in the stage three playoffs against Boston last season. But you look at this team now, and you just wonder, what is wrong with this team? Why are they struggling so much? And I ultimately think it's because this is a coaching staff that really struggles to grasp pressure and kind of really, really succumb to pressure. They're very bad with dealing with the pressure. And you have to put some blame on the roster as well and the players. But there are some things like the State 3 playoffs. Sabiobi should have been playing. That's not a decision for the six players that do play. Unless one of them said specifically, I will not play. Sabiobi needs to be playing. Um, but you ha- kind of listen to your coaching. And you wonder really what this team is doing. Um, and you really wonder how they've gotten to this point um, with knowing that this pressure is a problem. And I really want to see where this team goes from here. I've kind of lost some faith in this team's coaching because I think not playing Savi Obi was one of the worst coaching decisions I've ever seen ever um, in my history with the Overwatch League and my history with um, other sports. I don't understand it. There's nothing that I, I get about it. And I'm really curious to see what this team does going into stage four, going into season playoffs, How is this team going to bounce back? Because they have a very tough schedule in Stage 4. They might not even have a positive record in Stage 4. Their schedule is so hard. I want to see how this team bounces back. I want to see what they do. I want to see if they get motivated, if they can kind of have a very good, solid Stage 4 to prepare them for the season playoffs. There's obviously no Stage 4 playoffs, so that's not something they have to really worry about. But I'm curious what this team does going forward. I'm excited to see it. Um, I'm interested to see it. But I ultimately think this is a team where if they don't find success in the season playoffs. Like, if they make it to the finals and it's a very close series against Vancouver and they lose, maybe you're fine. If you make season playoffs and you get out round one, I don't think you can keep this coaching staff. I think you have to look at something obviously is a problem with this coaching staff. And maybe it is the roster as well, but I think the coaching staff is where you have to start. You have to say, we know we have talent on this roster. We got to move beyond it. We have, we have to be able to put some much better coaching in place and get us in a position where we can win. Because right now, that to me is, is the, the obvious problem, uh, the, the screaming problem. Um, but as someone on the outside, it's hard to tell what's going on. It's hard to know for sure exactly everything. So that's just my opinion. That's just what I um, have gotten the ideas of by watching this team play and learning more about this team's history. It seems very much like coaching has been a problem that has plagued this team since 2016, and it's still something that they have not figured out uh, completely. So with that, I'm going to end this video off. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, consider liking and subscribing. If you want more videos like this in the future, let me know. Um, Obviously, my history with Overwatch uh, competitively, not the farthest back. So uh, the more I can learn, the better. Uh, But... I'm getting out of here. Once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you all next time.